And now we're going to learn a little about ionic bonding. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to predict which compounds are held together by ionic bonding. We're also going to learn a little bit about what happens to elements as this ionic compound forms. And finally, we're going to talk about some of the properties or characteristics of an ionic compound. The first thing we'll look at is what exactly an ionic compound is. Now get this. This is big. An ionic compound is a compound held together by ionic bonds. What exactly is an ionic bond? An ionic bond is an electrostatic attraction of oppositely charged ions. And as we know, if there's something positive and something negative, they will attract each other. An ionic compound forms when you have a metal, something from the left side of the periodic table, bonded to a nonmetal, an element from the right side. For example, sodium chloride is a compound. It's made of more than one element. And we find sodium over here on the left side of the periodic table. While chlorine appears over here, it is a nonmetal. It's on the right side. So if you were to see this formula, you would predict this is an ionic compound. It's got a metal and a nonmetal. If, however, you had a compound that was made of oxygen and chlorine, and there is such a compound called oxygen dichloride, you can tell from this formula this is not ionic. This is actually a covalent compound because it is made of two nonmetals. So what about this compound? Sodium hypochlorite, or bleach. Would this be an ionic compound or a covalent compound? Well, because it has a metal and nonmetals, that makes it ionic. Even though this has three different elements in it, as long as there's a metal combined with nonmetal or more than one nonmetal, we're going to use this to predict it's an ionic compound. Now let's talk about what happens when these two elements combine to form a compound. In our example here, I've got lithium and sulfur, two elements on opposite sides of the periodic table. So we know this is going to be an ionic compound. I've represented lithium with Bohr's model. That is, I drew electrons in orbits around a nucleus. There's another way that you can represent this also, and that is to draw the electrons as dots in a Lewis dot diagram. If I were to do this, recall I'm only including the outermost electrons, the ones in the outside shell. So lithium would get one dot. I could do the same for sulfur. Sulfur is an element that's in group 16. So if I drew the Lewis dot diagram for sulfur, there would be six dots around it, or six valence electrons. This notation here is known as electron configuration, and it's another way to represent this element. If I were going to do the electron configuration for sulfur, I may abbreviate the first 10 electrons using the symbol NE in brackets, and then just write the remaining electrons in a sulfur atom. In each of these representations, it's clear how many valence electrons the elements have. Lithium has one valence electron. You see it in the outer ring. You can represent it as a single dot in the Lewis dot diagram. Or it also appears as the highest energy level electrons, the superscript number in electron configuration. The same is true for sulfur. You'll notice that sulfur has six electrons in its outer ring. Those are represented by six dots in my Lewis dot diagram. Or if you're looking at electron configuration, again, you look at the highest energy level, which would be energy level three, and you add up all of the electrons in that level, which would be six. As lithium forms an ion, these two lithium atoms each lose their valence electron. And again, the reason for this is it will create a more stable ion. It's got a full set of valence electrons now. So the metal always has electrons to give away, and metals will lose their electrons, which means the metals will become positively charged. Now remember how this works. An atom has positively charged protons. There are three of those in this lithium atom. And it has negatively charged electrons, and there are two of those. So this ion now has a net charge of plus one because it lost an electron.
It's a little confusing. When you lose electrons, you become positively charged. Each lithium did this. So now I've created the lithium ion. On the flip side, the nonmetal tends to gain electrons. And that's because the nonmetal needs one or two or maybe three more electrons to achieve a full set of electrons. Now there's a few things I wanted you to notice here. If I wanted to show this process in my Lewis dot diagram or my electron configuration, I would simply remove that outermost valence electron or erase that outermost electron. In fact, the entire sublevel would disappear. Now let's look at the other side. The nonmetal in this process tends to gain an electron or electrons. That is because nonmetals are one or two, maybe three electrons short of achieving a full set of valence electrons. And so these elements will gain electrons. In this case, we gained two electrons. And let's see, why would we gain two electrons? Well, if you notice, Bohr's model now shows a complete set of valence electrons. With the addition of those two electrons, we now have eight in the outermost shell. We could also show this in the Lewis dot diagram by adding a couple more dots to the Lewis dot diagram, or by changing this number here from a four to a six. And now you can see we've got a full set of valence electrons. This makes each of the ions more stable. I also want to point out to you something that happened in the name of these ions. Lithium's name didn't really change. We might now call it the lithium ion instead of a lithium atom, but it's still lithium. Sulfur, however, took on a new ending to its name. So sulfur becomes sulfide. If this were to happen to oxygen, oxygen would become oxide. Chlorine becomes chloride. Now the final part of this ionic compound formation occurs when the oppositely charged ions get together. Because as we all know, opposites attract. And now we've created an ionic compound. A compound between two lithium ions and one sulfide ion, held together by electrostatic attraction. The last thing we're going to look at are these characteristics or properties of ionic compounds. The first property is that ionic compounds form a repeating organized structure known as a lattice. In the lattice structure, you'll notice that all the positive ions are surrounded by negative ions and vice versa. It's not simply made of two lithium ions and one sulfide ion. It's not simply made of one positive ion with one negative ion, but literally trillions upon trillions of these ions all organized together in a repeating lattice. This lattice helps us understand the next property. Ionic compounds have very high melting points and high boiling points, and that's because they have strong bonding holding them together. If you'll notice the highlighted ion in the middle of this diagram, it's surrounded by negative ions in every direction. This creates strong bonds all around, and it helps us understand why it takes so much energy if you want to melt something like salt or some other ionic compound. Ionic compounds tend to be hard and brittle, so when you hit them with a hammer, you can't simply reshape them. You may realign these ions, putting the positive ions next to positive ions and negative ions next to negative ions. These, of course, do not attract. This will cause this compound to break or shatter. The next property is that ionic compounds are usually soluble in water. And let's look at why that would be true. Water is a polar molecule with a positive and a negative end. And so when water comes near an ionic compound, it can arrange itself to attract those ions and actually overcome the ionic bonds that hold them in place. Working together, these water molecules may eventually separate ions from the other ions dissolving the compound. And so we say ionic compounds are soluble in water. When an ionic compound does form a solution, it's often an electrolyte. This means it carries electricity. For a substance to carry electricity, you need to have charged particles that are free to move around. So in the solid, the ions are not free to move. They're locked into position. However, once it dissolves, those ions can move about and can carry an electrical charge. This makes them what we call electrolytes.
And so in this lesson, we learned how to predict which compounds are held by ionic bonds. We also learned how to describe what happens to these elements as they become ions and then are attracted to each other. And finally, we learned how to explain some of the properties of ionic compounds, that they're made of this repeating lattice structure. They have a high melting and boiling point due to the bonding, and that they're hard and brittle. However, they can dissolve in water, and when they do, they carry an electrical charge. I hope this brief lesson helps you better understand ionic compounds and the bonding that occurs in them.